<clears throat> Malachi chapter number 3. I want to read verses 1 through 12 today. Um, really the passage that I'll be using is just going to be verses 10, 11, and 12. But I do think it's important for us to see this context. It's an amazing thing. Um, as long as I've been in the ministry, um, 30 um, five years now that I've been in the ministry, this is, it has always been that there are those who uh, will challenge a Baptist preacher, probably other kinds of preachers too, but a Baptist preacher for sure, um, on the issue of tithing. Then they'll say tithing is an Old Testament principle, it's not a New Testament principle, and nowhere in the Bible, they'll say nowhere in the Bible does it teach that New Testament Christians have to tithe. And uh, I think what the Bible does teach in the New Testament is that New, Te uh, is that New Testament Christians give beyond the tithe. Tithing is a place to begin. And, but one of the passages that, uh, that we can use to teach the principle of tithing is Malachi chapter number 3 and uh, at verses uh, uh, 10, 11, yeah, verses, uh, verse 10 especially. And, uh, but, and they'll say that's Old Testament, it's not New Testament. But what I want to show you from this passage when we read the context, this is a prophecy con concerning John the Baptist and his preaching of the coming of Christ. Malachi chapter number 3, the passage that teaches us that it is robbery to not tithe is in context talking about new, the New Testament age, the church age what, that we live in right now. So I think that's very important to see that while it's in the Old Testament, it, it, this passage is specifically speaking about a New Testament time. All right, so let's begin here in uh, Proverbs, uh, Malachi chapter number 3, starting in verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek uh, uh, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. i got to make sure that I... Um, uh, but, who may, but who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. And they may, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old as, and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, and the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and, um, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change uh, um, I am, uh, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherein shall we return? Will, you, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithe, and wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your, of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So um, I've made it a practice over the last number of years since we started holding the, the Missions Emphasis Month rather than a, a week-long missions conference. Uh, I've made it a practice that what I do is as each of the preachers through the month um, preach, uh, I, I make notes, I take notes as they're preaching, and, um, and I use those notes. A lot of times I, I, I try to prepare the messages, at least one message or the messages for the day, it depends on how things work out, uh, based Based on things that we've heard from these preachers through throughout the month. And so I try to use what we've heard and kind of summarize it in some way or use it um, uh, to, 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 to finalize and put the capstone on our Faith Promise Month. And the lesson I want to I bring you this morning kind of springs from two different uh, sources. Um, one of them is the, the Sunday before we began our, mission, faith, our uh, missions for the emphasis month was, I call it, uh, I love my church Sunday. It's when we give the, the report, the, 
the annual church report. And uh, um, so I had done that on the last Feb uh, Sunday night of February. And then the first Sunday school of March, Brother Matheny was, uh, uh, brought the lesson. And so um, this Sunday school lesson comes from uh, some of the things that I was thinking because of the, uh, of the, the, the February, last se Sunday night of February. And then based on some things that I, then, all, you know, I, I had that in my mind. And all of a sudden now here's Brother Matheny and he's bringing the Sunday school lesson. And, um, and because of what I was thinking about and then what Brother Matheny said in his Sunday school lesson, it kind of gave me the, um, the thought that I want to bring in this Sunday school lesson today. Brother Matheny, um, <clears throat> is an, he's an observant person, first of all, when you, you just know him. He sees things and, and, uh, and he's an open person. So if he sees things, he's most likely going to tell you what he sees. He's going to, he's just, I don't know if he does that with everybody. I kind of assume he does. Um, but uh, he tends to just speak his mind. If he sees something and, and he thinks something, that you're going to know what he sees and thinks. He's just that kind of a person. And he is a concerned person when it comes uh, to the things of the Lord and maybe um, uniquely concerned about what happens at this church because he was involved in the uh, in the early years of this church's existence, and so he never visits our church um, without commenting on uh, to me commenting on several things. He always talks to me about the number of people that are in the services. Um, before the service and after the service, he talks about it. Uh, he talks about the number of visitors. He recognizes, he, he notices, or at least he thinks he notices, when there's somebody he has never seen before, and when there are visitors in the service, someone he'd never seen before, and uh, he always notices those things. Um, he notices new families. Um, and uh, Brother Watkins is here. When, uh, when the Watkins joined our church, Brother uh, Matheny took me aside one day and said, the Watkins have joined your church. And he used a phrase I thought was really funny. The church, you know, people use, he said, that's a win. So I just want you to know he considers you a win. And so I just, uh, I mean, he said, that's a win. You got the Watkins. Anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, he just says things like that. And he always notices uh, in the Sunday, dirt before the Sunday school class, we have that welcome screen up and it gives, it tells how much um, is in our faith promise. And uh, he always notices those things. And so he was going to do the Sunday school lesson that first Sunday of March this year. And, and uh, before the Sunday school began, uh, he looked at how many people were here. And then he looked at the number that was on the board. And then he began to ask me some questions. Um, and questions, I'm going to be honest with you, that I wouldn't answer for any other missionary. Uh, uh, they're uncomfortable to me. And, you know, and uh, I wouldn't, an and I don't think they're anyone else's business but our own. Except I can think of, I think of Brother Matheny kind of as our own. So I'll give him some leeway on these things. And, and uh, so he started asking me, before the Sunday school class, he started asking me. Now, I uh, know there's your faith promise up there. And he says, uh, how many missionaries? Of course, I, I messed up on that. Uh, he asked that publicly, didn't he? And uh, how many missionaries we support? Uh, how much money do we have in the bank? He wanted to know how much money we had in the bank. And how much, you know, you get this much. How much are you? And he wanted to know all this kind of stuff. And then he got up. Uh, and uh, he knows our property is debt free. He asked about that. He knows that we have money in the bank. And. Uh, um, that was the thing that was on my mind because of the of the f February the I love my church report that I gave when we have money and he knew that he knew uh, he specifically asked and so uh, he knew that we had money in the bank that we're not you know running on empty around here and uh, knew that our property is debt free and so forth and and armed with that knowledge uh, he said something in Sunday school that I had never thought of before he said that our church is in a, in a good position to give cheerfully to God because we're not in debt, we can give cheerfully and not of necessity. Just thought that was an interesting. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, it says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, and this passage is one that, that is tied very closely into the concept of faith promise missions. It says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The Bible tells us that, that, we are, that when we give, it ought to be something we purpose in our heart. It ought not to be given grudgingly, and it ought not to be given of necessity. And so I can hear someone say, well, I'm not happy about giving, and therefore uh, it would be unscriptural for me to give, you know. And uh, I don't want to give this much, and it would be unscriptural because I've got a grudge in my heart. And, uh, but, they, but I always thought that giving cheerfully and not grudgingly was a, was a matter of the heart. It was an attitude, you know, that uh, I want to I develop 
an attitude where I'm thankful to give to the Lord. And, and Brother Matheny helped me to see that the reason we can give cheerfully is because we don't have to give. We don't have to give. There's no bill that's going to go unpaid if you do not give today. Um, there's, uh, the lights will still be on next week if you do not give today. Uh, no one's going to come and confiscate the building from us if you don't give today. We're not in danger of defaulting on any loans if you don't give today. Uh, uh, you know, if you give today, it will be because you want to give and not because you have to give in order for this place to exist. Uh, I know churches that, um, and, and that, that, have to, that have to have an offering. They have to have a certain amount of money come in. Uh, in today's offering, they will need a certain amount of money uh, in order to pay the bills that they have for this week. And, uh, and I know in some churches what they'll do is if, enough, if that amount of money doesn't come in, they will take another offering. I know some churches that will continue to take offerings until they get enough. They got guys counting it and they'll give a report right there and say that's not enough. We're doing this again. And you're going to keep giving and giving and giving until we can pay the bills. So there, there's lights and heat and chairs to sit in and a building to be uh, uh, in next week. And there are churches that have to do those things. And, and we can give cheerfully because we're not in that kind of position. I, I, I've told, I think uh, you've heard me say this before, I when I first started the ministry, I, I knew two pastors in the state of Oregon that um, would brag, they, they would say it like this, we pastor the largest debts in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they would put it. And both of these guys would say this. That it was a philosophy that they had that um, um, they were constantly in a building program. They were always building new buildings and uh, buying, you know, sell all their buses and buy new buses, not brand new ones, but, you know, new buses. Because uh, in their mind, the only way to compel people to give faithfully was to keep pressure on them. We have to have this money to pay for these buses. We have to have this money to pay for this building. We have to have this money for this, uh, you know, and so they kept uh, things, you know, uh, pressure on people to give by putting, by constantly keeping the church in debt. And I've just never agreed with that kind of thinking, whether right, wrong, or indifferent, that's just not how I, I think. And uh, um, when I came to this church, I, I told you when I uh, became the pastor, I said, if you'll be faithful tithing, I will do my best to be faithful in using those ties for the Lord. And uh, it seems to me that that's worked out pretty well, that you've been faithful, some of you, and, um, and, I've, tried to, and I've tried to be for frugal. <laughs> Is frugal a good biblical Baptist word? I don't know. That's, uh, maybe I'm just cheap. But uh, I've tried to, uh, you know, and so far, we, so far, I don't know if it'll continue this way forever, but so far we have money in the bank. So while Brother Matheny was teaching that first Sunday of March, a, a question entered my head. Uh, and the question is this, why give? Why would you want to give when you know that there is money in the bank? Why would you want to do that? Um, since we're not in danger of losing our building or not having lights next week or, you know, some, since, since um, our missionaries, if you don't, if for whatever reason you decided today you just couldn't do it, um, our missionaries are still going to get support. Uh, you know, why would you want to give? Why should you give? Um, when we have money in the bank. And so uh, I want to try to answer that question today uh, based here out of Malachi in chapter number three. Answer that question. Number one, you should give because God told you to. <laughs> Duh. But I'm going to tell you something. Isn't it, I, just because we know God says something in the Bible doesn't always know, mean that we do what God says. Do you have any place in your life where you struggle doing, being obedient to the Lord? Yeah. So the fact is that um, that because God commands it may not be com all of the reason in the world that you need to uh, to give. But the, but I do want to point out to you that this is a command of the Lord. The Bible tells us in Malachi chapter number three verses eight through ten: Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Can you see? Here's what they're saying: God says you've robbed me, and they said, How? We haven't robbed you, God. And God says, yes, you have in tithes and offerings. 
And I'm going to suggest to you today that there are plenty of people who call themselves Christians who say, I don't have to do this thing. I don't have to tithe and I don't have to give offerings. I don't have to be a part. I don't have to do those things to please God, to make God happy with me. And you don't have to do those things to be saved, but you do have to do those things if you want to be obedient to God. Will a man rob God? You see, ye have robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Then God says, you are cursed with the curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now, here was saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open the, you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be, uh, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And again, uh, began the Sunday school, I make no apologies for using this Old Testament passage in a New Testament church. It is, I think, the context is a New Testament context. It is the, uh, the transition is happening in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And Malachi is pointing his finger toward John the Baptist and toward a new age and a new era and a new time where John the Baptist will be, say, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And, and, um, and so I think the passage is very clearly moving into the New Testament er period of time. And I think it applies very clearly to to our day today. So I want you to notice a few things. I've got to guess it up on the board there. Um, number one, God told you where to bring your tithes. He says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. So he uses that phrase storehouse and then that phrase mine house. So we are to bring the tithes into God's house is what he says. In the New Testament age, God's house is a local New Testament Baptist church. This is where you bring your tithes, to this place. Today, you bring your tithe to the church. You, you tithe, your tithe is to always go to the local church. And, and, you're to, and you are, he says, you are to bring ye. So um, that suggests it's supposed to come with you to the church that you, to which you belong. And you you, you commit yourself to a local church and you bring your ties with you to that local church. It doesn't go to your favorite TV evangelist. It doesn't go to the, to the guy who promises to pray for your healing if you'll send him the money. It doesn't go to the most popular Christian ministry out there. You know, there's some big so-called ministries that accomplish some big so-called good. And the you know, devil can do good if, as long as it brings glory to him and not to the Lord. And, and uh, it, the tithe isn't to go to, to those things. The tithe is to go to the, to the local New Testament church that you belong to. Your tithe goes all the time, every time, to the storehouse of your local church. Then God told you why you should bring your tithes, and He said it's because if you don't, you're robbing God. It's a command. And if you don't do it, you're, you are not only disobedient, but you're a thief, is what He, what he says in this passage. It is, it is a sin. Why should you bring your tithe? Because it is a sin not to bring, and he, by the way, He says not just tithes, it is a sin not to bring tithes and offerings to the storehouse, which is His house, which is your church. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love Jesus, you're going to bring your tithes into your church's storehouse. It's just, it's that clear, I think. And then God told you not only uh, where to bring your tithes and not only why to bring your tithes, but God told you the goal of bringing your tithes. And he said that goal is that there may be meat in mine house. So plainly speaking, you bring your tithes in the house of God, not so the bills can be barely paid for that week, but so that the storehouse of your church is full. That's the idea. Bring it so that there, so that there is, that the storehouse, storehouse is someplace that you put extra, that you put what isn't used right then, that there may be meat in mine house. I, I praise the Lord uh, for, the, for those times in, in our churches, uh, when our church's storehouse looked a whole lot like the widow's barrel. And, uh, you know, um, uh, it always looked empty, but it never ran out. I thank the Lord that there, you know, for times in my ministry when it always looked empty, but it never ran out. And there have been times uh, in the ministry where it was like that. When I first started uh, in, in Astoria, it was very much like that. When I came here early on, it, was, it seemed a lot like that. And, um, and it just seemed like there were, God just kept meeting the needs and providing and praise the Lord for it. And I, 
and I thank God for that, but it's not biblical. It is not a biblical goal for a church's storehouse to run like the widow's barrel. That's not, it's not biblical for it to be that way. I thank the Lord that he can provide when it's that way, but it's not biblical for it to be that way. God says, I want you to give so that there is meat in my, give, uh, bring your tithes to the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house so that there, there, so that the storehouse is full and give to, give so that it's full. Um, so just because there is money in the bank doesn't mean, oh, I don't, I, the pressure's off, I don't need to give. No, if there's money in the bank, you can say the, pre, the, the pressure is off, I get to give cheerfully at this point. Give even though we have enough right now because God commands you to. Number two, why give when we have money in the bank? First, uh, uh, secondly, because uh, God blesses you for doing it. God blesses you for doing it. In Malachi chapter 3 verses 10 and 11 and 12, bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes and ye shall not and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time uh, in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a, a, a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So, it's robbing God to not give him your tithes and offerings, but when we obey God in this commandment to give, to bring our tithes and offerings uh, into his storehouse so that there is meat in his house, God says, number one, he's going to pour you out a blessing. That's, prove me now if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God says he'll pour you out a blessing. Now, um, be a little bit careful here. Um, I, I, we, we tend to be, you, because we live in this real world, we tend to think um, of, of blessings as being um, worldly things. And so, uh, if I am faithful in tithing money, doesn't that mean that God's blessing is going to be money? And over the years, I have had people who said, I've been faithful tithing, and I've been faithful giving to missions, and God says he'll give me back a hundredfold, and I don't, get, I don't have a hundred times more money than I gave. And that kind of thing. The, the, the blessings, he says he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There will be no, uh, room enough to receive it. But those blessings may not come in the form. They may come in the form of financial blessings, but they might not. Um, God can bless you with some things that are way more important than finances. Peace in the heart. I would much rather be um, a very poor person who just barely gets by in this world and, be, and have peace in my heart than be a person who never has a financial need in the world and, and spend every day wishing I was dead. And it does happen. Some of the most common people to commit suicide are the wealthy and the famous. Um, God can bless you with just peace. God can bless you with uh, the ability to bless you with um, uh, the the um, uh, honor. I guess I'll use the word honor or the the privilege, the blessing of winning souls. Your, that your testimony is such that you're able to reach people with the gospel and uh, uh, God can bless you with, with uh, uh, happiness. There's a different, so peace is, is a confidence that everything is right between you and God. Happiness is a, is, is a, a joy in this world. Um, uh, God can bless you with happiness. God can bless you with um, um, a confidence, a boldness in the work that you do. Uh, he can, he can, and a number of things he can bless you with besides just money. So be careful and don't say, well, you know, I've been trying this thing and I tithed and I gave faith promise and I didn't get lots and lots and lots of money. There's other kinds of blessings. Make sure that, uh, I mean, look and make sure that, that, that uh, don't limit God by deciding what sort of blessing is the one that you 
you have to have from him. Let God pour, uh, pour you out his blessings and you'll discover that you're so much better off than you would have been if you had figured it out on your own. And then um, he, blessings, uh, God bless you. He rebukes, he says in verse 11, that he'll rebuke the devourer. If you'll do this thing, he'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes and shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. He'll rebuke uh, our devourers. Uh, I think this goes back to when you read this, the idea of, you know, um, uh, your, the fruit won't cast your fruit before the time and, uh, uh, and all of that. I think it goes back to the curse of Adam before the fall. Remember that passage? I'm going to read it to you. Uh, I'm running a little bit out of time, but I do want to read it, I think, still. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. He says, And uh, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which uh, I commanded thee, saying, uh, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thor Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So God said, because of, the, of their disobedience, that he had cursed them, so that, cursed Adam, so that he was going to earn his bread by the sweat of his face, and that he would, you know, it's kind of like that two steps forward, and, uh, and three steps back, or three steps forward, and two steps back, or however, that you make progress. Progress, but it won't be as fast as it could have been because you're going to plant and it's going to you're going to plant this thing and thorns are going to grow instead of the 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 uh, going to grow and um, and thistles are going to grow and you're you're trying to plant wheat but you're going to get uh, tares and that kind of a thing and, and and it's like what God says here in Malachi chapter three and verse eleven is that listen if you will obey me in this area. If you'll do this thing, if you will bring your tithes, be faithful in bringing your tithes and offerings in the storehouse, I'll reverse that Adamic curse for you. Um, it's like, if you'll do this thing, the ground isn't cursed for your sake anymore, and the thorns and the thistles are gone, th thorns and thistles are gone, and the sweat of your face gets wiped away. God blesses you. Now, um, I do understand that even those of us who are faithful in tithing and giving offerings, we still sweat when we work, and uh, and we, you know, we still uh, there's still weeds that grow in our gardens and things like that. I I, I know that that's. I just mean that, they, but I just mean that there's no curse in it anymore. I, I've told you the story. When, when I first started the ministry um, in Astoria, we started out there, and, and a guy came visit our church one time, and he was a marine biologist, which just sounds like the coolest job in the whole world. It does. It just sounds like a cool job. It isn't so cool. What his job was to tell you whether you got to get clams or not. He checked for the clams to see if they had red tithe poisoning, and, and that's what his job was. But anyway, he, so I said, you know, he comes to the church, you know, and I mean, and he's a marine biologist. Like, wow, that is so cool. He says, just like everything, under the curse. He's a marine biologist. He goes to work saying, this is a curse to do. <laughs> I'm just saying that when you come get a right attitude about this thing, when you come to a place where you're obeying God, um, life doesn't have to be a curse anymore. You don't have to get up and say, well, I'm going to go to work. What a curse. <laughs> well, I'm married to that woman. What a curse. <laughs> well, I need this bread. What a curse. <laughs> you know, that you can enjoy your life. Uh, if, if, if he rebukes the devourer. And then um, he gives a testimony in others. He's talking about this blessing. If you, if, you, if you obey the Lord, he'll give you a testimony among others. He says in verse 12, And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord. And I think this is specifically true in the context of faith promise, where we become friends and co-laborers with missionaries in all parts of the world because we're because we're part of faith promise and missions giving, um, uh, we know people who live in all parts of the world. We can pray with them. They come and we get to rejoice with them when they're here and fellowship with them because we're a part of what they're doing and co-laborers in those parts of the world. And so we get to be a testimony around the world. And then I got to get one last thing real quick. Uh, when, when, why give when we have money in the bank? Well, because uh, you don't know what God might have planned for the future. Um, I don't want to try to force my point now out of the book of Malachi. So, uh, so just let me say, um, no one knows what tomorrow holds. Um, 
So we have money in the bank today. That doesn't mean we have money in the bank tomorrow. Things happen. I hope they don't happen. I pray that they don't happen. Um, I want to make plans so that they don't happen. But it could be that, um, that something happens that, um, that um, um, we need the money that's in the storehouse and um, maybe need it and more. It could happen. It could be that, I don't know what it would be, but it could be that our church is given some kind of opportunity to do something bigger than you and I could even imagine right now. And God is allowing this, putting that meat in the storehouse, preparing us for this ministry opportunity that's bigger than we, can, than we could even conceive in our own minds. It, or it could be that God just wants it to be there for his own glory. It might be God just wants that money there so that Brother Matheny can come and say, wow, you guys have money in the bank. You can be cheerful givers. <laughs> might just be that that's all it's there for is um, I, I'm going to, I need to finish up this message. So I, I've got to get done with this real quick. So I want to give you a story in the book of Jeremiah. There is a, there's a passage in Jeremiah chapter 32 that um, it bothers me a little bit. Now, I, I mean that I'm using the word bother um, take it with a grain of salt. Right? It's a passage that, that is challenging to me. So Jeremiah is this prophet, and he's preaching to, that the Jews are supposed to um, surrender to Babylon and, uh, and go off into captivity. This is the righteous judgment of God upon them, and if they will do this thing, it'll be better for them than if they resist. That Either way, they're going to go into captivity, but one way they get to go in there alive, and the other way they get to go in there with their eyes plucked out. And uh, so, and Jeremiah's preaching, but, and so God wants to assure the children of Israel that even though you go into captivity, you're going to get your land back. You're going to come back. This t- captivity is a temporary thing. And so how he does that is he asks Jeremiah, God commands Jeremiah, uh, you have an uncle who's going to come and offer you a piece of property to sell you a piece of property. You have the right to buy it. And, uh, and God says, so I want you to buy this piece of property. And by buying the piece of property, you are demonstrating to the, to the rest of the nation that you believe God's going to let them come back to this land. So Jeremiah does it. He weighs out the money and he signs all the paperwork and he does all the things. He's in prison, by the way. He is a prisoner who uses his money to buy a piece of property from an uncle. And then after um, he's, he never, he's released from prison, but what happens to him is he is taken against his will to Egypt where he dies. He bought this piece of property and never ever even got to see it. God, that, what, that's a waste of his money. Why would you make him do that? Well, because money isn't the thing God's really interested in. Um, the whole pur- listen, the whole purpose of giving is not about money, and it's not about need. You're giving. The purpose of your giving is about the blessings, the lessons, and the benefits that you receive when you give. It's not about give so that we have the church. It's give so that God can bless you. That's why you do it.